So uh, everybody, I've taken a look in the, the chat and Jack was uh, suggesting the topic of bird nests. And that uh, can, I think is a, a really interesting subject. Um, maybe what we can do is, um, well, I need to push the right button. Um, Jack, is it all right if I bring you on for just a brief discussion about sort of what you're thinking about bird nests and what the challenges are that you've been facing? And um, the, and we'll, we'll sort of see what, I'm gonna add you into my spotlight here. And now you can unmute. Hey, um, so I put that in because every time I see a bird nest, like we, there's, we have a big like, um, we have a lot of forsythia in our yard and there's so many bird nests in there. And every time I try to sketch one, it just ends up looking so weird. And like, you know, um, <laughs> And I just, I'm, I always, I, it never looks like a bird nest. So that's, yeah. yeah I, let's, 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 I think that's a, a, a really interesting topic. It'd be really fun for us to play with. Um, so let's explore that a little bit deeper because there's a number of strategies that you can use that I find that, that really, that really make a big difference and help. So um, thank you so much for that. And we'll check in with you at the end of the workshop. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you. All right, so today, folks, let's take a look at some drawing some bird nests. Let's first just talk a little bit about um, this time of year and bird nesting strategies. Um, we're getting into the time of year that birds are building their little bird nests. And um, during winter time, when all the leaves have fallen off the trees, that's a great and the easiest time to find old bird nests. And you look around like, there's a bird nest. I had no real, I had no idea. There's one in this bush and this bush and this bush. And then they all drop their leaves. Like, look at all the bird nests that were right here in front of you. And those are times that it's pretty safe to walk up to the bird nests and you can even disassemble them and try to figure out, oh, if you ever disassemble a bird nest, try to put it back together and you'll get a greater appreciation for the birds themselves. Because it's really, really, really hard to do. And you realize that, wow, you don't have opposable thumbs and you made this thing. But at this time of year, when they're starting to kind of go into their nesting season, um, this is a time where we have to be really careful about in our investigations of bird nests. So what we wanna do is if we have a bird nests where we can see it kind of from a distance um, and in a sneaky way observe it, then at this season, we can investigate ourselves some bird nests. Um, but uh, just as a cautionary tale, I want to tell you a story of what happened, uh, what, the, what happened in the Point Reyes Bird Observatory. <clears throat> so the Point Reyes Bird Observatory is a amazing uh, research institute, institution on the California coast, now called Point Blue Conservation Science. But back in those days, it was the Point Reyes Bird Observatory. And they were doing this cool study on um, white crown sparrows. And they were looking at nesting success in these white crown sparrows. And so they had this team of biologists who would go out, they'd watch the, the white crown sparrows. And they would see where the white crown sparrows went. And if they saw it carrying nesting material or food, then, ooh, we have a nest. And so you'd go, you'd check on the nest and you'd write down how many eggs and, or whether they'd hatched. And then over, the, the, over time, you would then figure out you know, like, you know, of all the, the white crown sparrows in our area, this many, uh, here's the average number of eggs, here's the average number of, um, of, of, of chicks successfully raised. And what they discovered is that these birds were successfully making nests, they were successfully laying eggs, but almost all the chicks in their study area were eaten by predators. And this was, this was really disturbing. Like, wow, how is it that, 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 that you know, the predators, they just hammer these poor little white crown sparrows. And then a really observant biologist was out there one day and was looking up at, um, as they're doing the, the white crown surveys and realized that there was a scrub jay 
that from perch to perch to perch, as the researchers were walking around, was following the researchers. And what it was doing is it had figured out that these people are studying bird nests. And what the jay was doing is it would just kind of watch where the bird, uh, where the, 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 uh, the researchers went. And then once the researchers left, would fly down like, oh, it's a nest. I'm going to have to come back here a little bit later and come back like, oh, it's eggs and eat the eggs or eat the chicks. So um, once they realized that they were dealing with corvids, they had to completely change all their procedures and protocols for studying nests. And um, if, uh, if, there, you know, if there were any jays around, you couldn't do your nest surveys. If there were, um, and, and, and they kind of found all these other ways of doing it, but they realized they had to outsmart the jays. So the danger of bringing the predator to the nest in the springtime is, 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 is significant. Um, so we just have to be kind of careful as we're, we're, we're doing that. But if you have an old nest, they're not reusing those same nests um, for most little kind of passerine sort of perching bird nests. You know, raptors and these big nests and things, yeah, they reuse those. But the, the, the little, like the, the robin's gonna make a new nest every year. And so you can uh, really kind of geek out on those. Let's take a look now at how we play with the textures on those nests. Well, actually, there's two things. We're gonna first do shape, and then secondly, we're going to do texture, all right? And so what I like to do in this is first establish something that gives me the shape, and then I'm going to layer over that a sense of texture. And I've got some fun strategies that I think will help you be able to do that. Let's take a look. All right, um, let's first just talk bird nest shape. And what I want to do is I want to get a, um, I want to get, uh, make a sketch that is going to show, this is over here. There we go. Um, There we go. Um, so I want to first make a sketch that is going to represent the, the, the shape of that nest. And let's start with thinking about the basic cup-shaped nest. And I'm going to make sort of a crude diagram of it. I'm drawing an oval. And if this is the center of my oval, I'm going to place a second oval. inside that. And on that second oval, it's going to be thicker here than it is here. And the reason for that is, so this distance here, um, you know, here you're kind of looking at a foreshortened distance on this. So if these were two concentric circles, you would see this being thicker than this dimension here. So, and then, I'm going to turn that into a cup. So there is a sort of simple cup shape. If I light this, um, so let's say I've got a light that is coming from this direction up here. And there's a convention in scientific illustration that the <clears throat> light usually comes from the top left-hand corner. And um, that if the, so if the light is coming from here, this surface up here on top is getting sunlight. But this area in here is blocked by this wall. So this area here is in shade. And as you kind of go out along this wall, that shade is going to get lighter. And eventually, you're going to have full light 
kind of cast down into this cup. With the darkest shadows being over there in that corner. This surface here is probably getting some light. But this surface over here is going to be in shade. I'm actually going to leave, instead of uh, making my shadow go all the way out to the far edge of this, I'm going to put a darkest shadow here along the side. But see, I've left a little crescent of light in there. That's my little reflected light zone. Um, so if there's light that is passing this here, but it's bouncing off the branch here and then bouncing back, that will light this area up a little bit. I'm going to then have a little bit of a zone of a little bit lighter, lighter. Right. So in essentially, I've made myself an ashtray here, right? Um, but this is useful just for thinking about what I really want to show with my shadows. If I want this to sort of feel kind of have the form, kind of this cup form, then this is going to be what is going to be happening with those shadows on that form. Now let's think about texture on top of this. This is really fun. I want this to be made out of, say, fine grasses, all woven together. And here's what doesn't work. If I start to draw in all the grasses, I get this scribble. And it doesn't look very satisfying at all. The reason that this doesn't really look right is that on the, um, on the nest here, the grass blades, let's say there's a grass blade that is going across in the front here. That one's probably going to be catching more light than other ones. So if I draw in that grass blade as a dark thing, um, I'm drawing in all my grass blades as darks. But this space between them, see that space between it right there? That space between my grass blades, that in reality be, would be where my darkest dark is, because that's a shadow area between the grass blades. But if I'm in here just drawing in my grass blades, then I get this negative picture, the reverse of what I want. I now have dark grass blades with light, the places that should be dark shadows between them being dark. What row? How do I handle that? Well, there are <laughs> a lot of ways that I can. Let's take a look at some of them. I am moving across the room here, getting new supplies. All right, here I go. So um, one way um, that I can do that is, well, first of all, I'm going to just, I'm going to start by giving myself just a little bit, make these sort of shadow areas a little bit bolder, because I'm going to try to put an area of tone across the whole thing, even a little bit into here and a little bit into there. So I've given myself a lot of graphite. Now this is some of these grass blades are really light colored. Um, but I'm starting here just by smudging that entire thing. Now I am going to grab myself a little smudging tool. Hold on a second. I'll figure out where my Just a second. And pencils. Um, I am or little 
paper smudging tool and I don't see one. Well, you can buy in art supply stores little paper smudging tools and I'm not seeing one. So I'm gonna just take this little piece of paper here and make my own. And uh, what I'm going to do is take this paper and roll it. like that, and then twist it. There are ways of doing this a little bit more neatly, but I've ended up with a sort of a stick of, of paper here. And what I'm gonna do with that is come along and blend this. Here's the upper part. Here is this part. Um, for this, it's going to help me to start with this kind of gray toned bowl. All right, so there's sort of my smooth gray toned bowl. And I want, I can even, I'm gonna make some of the, the darks in here a little bit darker, make some of the darks in here a little bit darker, re-smudge that a little bit, re-smudge that a little bit, there it is. So there is my, <clears throat> my gray toned bowl. And now what I'm going to do is I have a, eraser here that has a very, very fine tip on it. So this is what's called a, a mono zero eraser. It's made by Tombow. And it has a round, thin eraser. And this is this, you can find with several different brands, different brands of, of small erasers. Um, and I'll show you what to do in a moment if you don't have that. Um, but if you do, what I can do with this is I can then start to just draw in with this, just as if I am now these um, around the sides here, I've got, I'm drawing in my grass blades. And then see, I'm just sort of drawing these across this surface. And then there's going to be a lot here on the top. Oh, there's a big windstorm happening here in San Mateo right now. And I would really want to pay a lot of attention to the shape of the actual um, the, the shape and the direction of actual strands and fibers that I see on the real nest in front of me. Um, and ones that are going to go in this sort of a direction are also going to be very helpful in sort of establishing the shape of this cup. We call those cro cross contour lines. Um, so I'm just putting in a few of those. And then once I have a few of those, so this isn't where I stop. This is this is just this is the midpoint. So step one was here's step one. Step one was just to put in some graphite. Step two was we had some graphite in there, and we smudged it right. Step three was we erased into that. Now. Step four, this is going to be, this is, this is where the magic happens. Um, step four and five. There's four. Here's five. So both of these get smudged into. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is on 
a few of these fibers that are on it, I am going to trace around the edges. So let me kind of zoom down on this a little bit more. So watch, I'm gonna actually make some of these thicker, like this one here, I want it to be thicker. This one here, I want it to be thicker. A little bit of line variation is gonna be interesting in here as well. So some thicker, some thinner. And what I'm going to do is I am going to trace around the edges of a few of these. So I'm drawing over this one and I'm gonna draw around this one and I'm gonna draw over this one. And then I'm going to take this one over here. And so I'm just sitting down with these and trying to reinforce some of the edges. of some of these fibers. You just do a little bit more in here. Um, this big bold edge of my cup line, I think I'm gonna dispense with that. And smudge into that a little bit. Um, so I've got one little fiber that's coming over here like this. I've got another little fiber that's gonna come down here. I've got another little fiber, don't press too hard. And it's a lot easier to draw the edges of, if, I mean, you, you could just sort of start by drawing all these things overlapping like this. But things that will, will look a little bit more organic and kind of wrapping around you if you are sort of tracing around the edges of lines that you have uh, created with the with that eraser. And if I really had a nest in front of me, I could be looking at that nest now and you know that would help me figure out which ones are on top which ones are tucking underneath and over the edge of this let's pay attention to what these little strands do when they come over the edge when if i have a surface let's just draw a little cube here If I have, think about uh, if I have a Christmas present for you and you're looking at it from the side and I put string around it, right? And the string comes up on the side and it goes over the top. There's another one that comes around here and there's a little bow on top there, right? If I rotate this box this way, I'm gonna see that string coming up and 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 straight up there. But if I also rotate it to the side a little bit, so that here's the front of the box. Now here's this other side of the box. And here's this other side of the box. And here's this other side of the box. That line as it comes up, instead of being straight up here, you're going to see it change directions as it goes over. Whoops, we're off screen. 
all of those boxes off screen. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so here's here's the first box which went um, straight up from the side. And then if I rotate this, the top towards me a little bit, I get something like this with that string kind of the bow here. But if I rotate this around to the side this way, then I see that that string actually changes its angle when it goes over the side of the box. So that's what I want to think of, that when I'm coming over the lip of something, I'm going to change my angle. And so if this little string comes up here, I'm going to change its angle over the top of the nest. So a little thing could come here and come down like that. So I want to think of how these lines are going to wrap around the edge of the nest here. And looking at your actual nest will help you see that. Look for an individual grass blade on this in this zone in here, in this zone in here, and see what it does, what you see that doing when it comes up here. And that helps sort of round that, that nest. Now in the back there, there's again, not going to be this hard line right there but you will see your edges of your grass blades changing their direction as they come in there. Let's put a little guy here. And it is gonna go like that. There's another one that comes up here. The other thing that's going to make this feel a little bit less ashtray is that this hard kind of ashtray shape, um, I want that to be broken by little strands sticking out here and there. Um, but still, it should suggest the general form. So if I have that sticking out here, if I have another kind of one looping over here, I'm gonna do the same here. I'm gonna just poke a few holes in this edge and allow some of these, 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 these fibers to be a little bit more kind of loosely arranged. All right, now, 
So step number three was I erased those lines. Step number four is I drew in some of those edges and I refined some of the edges, all right? Okay. So let's do step number four again here. And now I'm gonna show you what step number five is, whoopsie. What step number five is, is to come into some of these little spaces in here and really punch in the shadows. I'm gonna kind of get into some of these spaces and punch in some of those shadows. And not all of them, I wanna do really some nice dark shadows in here. And as I'm putting in those shadows, I'm paying attention to those edges and I get much more kind of interesting kind of organic shadows. Isn't that cool? Um, if I were just to make those up, not going on top of a template of where there were kind of pre-existing, um, now I'm gonna put a few little kind of dots of shadows out here. Just a hint as into kind of going into this light side that there's just a few places where there's some variation in there. And then I'm gonna do the same right in here into this shadow zone. Here's a shadow. Here's a shadow. Here's a some nice little darks, little jewels of darkness in there. It then pops the shape of those ones that are in front of it. You can in here, like I'm just gonna put a little kind of little shadow in there and that will Sort of makes it feel like this nest has greater depth. There, we're seeing a lot of kind of glare and reflection here. Let's see if I can change the angle of this a little bit so that, yeah, there, that's a little bit less glary. I think down that other angle, the, we're getting a lot of shine and sheen off of the 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 the, the pencil there. Um, I don't want to put shadows everywhere on it. Um, so in this darkest zone over here, I've got more shadows. In this dark zone over here, I've got more shadows. And then a few places across it. Popping in some of those shadows just for interest and evidence and, and, and emphasis. And that really kind of gives me this effect of this thing is made by fibers that are all twisting around in front of each other. This area up in here needs a little bit of love, doesn't it? Lastly, if I back here, put a dark shadow on the paper, then it is, it is sitting on that flat surface.
So that is with graphite pencil, um, nest study number one. Something that is helping me kind of get these really rich darks on mine is that I'm using 2B lead on my drawing. So my drawing's done with 2B lead with an HB pencil that's going to be not, I'm not going to be able to get those sort of same kind of dark, dark darks. But this allows me to kind of punch in those really, those deep divots of darkness. Um, and the, uh, that that should help. Um, let's take a look at um, another approach to doing this. Um, this time I'm going to use watercolor. But I'm going to basically block in a nest shape again. So maybe not the same set of hard edges. Could you raise your page? Ah, uh, thank you. But I want this to feel as if it's this sort of crisscrossy fibers and 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 structure. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to just do a little test off on the side of my paper with this white Prismacolor pencil. So it's a white colored pencil that's fairly waxy. Different types of colored pencils have different degrees of waxiness to them. And so um, I'm first just gonna do a little test of some lines and because this may react differently on different types of paper. So I'm not going to assume that it is going to work this way on my paper. Um, and then I am going to come across that with some white paint, some paint. Okay. I was expecting to get better um, sort of more clear pale. So I'm going to get this will be a little bit darker. And now let's watch this for a moment. And as we're sitting here, you see those white lines starting to appear. The reason they are is that the the paper is absorbing the watercolor and where the pencil is, those lines are, um, the wax of the pencil is sort of keeping them at bay. Um, if you don't have a white crystal colored pencil, another tool that works great for this sort of stuff is a crayon. So I'm gonna take my white crayon and I'm gonna draw some lines and we're gonna do a little test with that. Ooh, now that is much more dramatic, isn't it? So the advantage of this is that there's a little bit of tone to it. The advantage of this is that it is super bright. All right, so I can use those two together to my advantage. I also want to show you one other thing that I can do over here on this one. The one where I've drawn these lines with the pencil, the, some of that, the color that you see here is just sitting on top of the wax. And I can lightly with my brush come along and stroke that off with a clean brush and be able to pick out. So I'm making a stroke here on that pencil line. And you see how that's pulling out some of those fibers. So I'm wiping it, then I'm cleaning my brush off, giving it a little wipe, cleaning my brush off. So I can get 
Um, this is much more stark. This is a little bit more, more plastic. So let's first give ourselves, let's say it's um, just there are light colored grasses throughout this whole thing um, that are uh, sort of light tan brown grasses. What I can do is I can start with something that's going to be slightly lighter value than I'm going to be getting in the sort of the darkest parts of that. But this is going to give me just sort of a base coat of um, light. Oh, Jack, your paper's sliding just a tad. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, my as I was painting. All right, I'm now going to give this a little bit of shadow. Um, I'm going to test my shadow color here. That was a little bit too dark. Um, add a little bit more water to it. All right. I'm going to get myself a little bit of, there's that part of my basket there. Here. And then I let that dry completely. I'm gonna be using a hair dryer to speed things up. If I put white pencil down on wet watercolor on wet paper, it just makes a little groove in the paper and it doesn't work very well. But once the paper is dry, I can draw across it and get um, all my kind of lovely, uh, the, the effects which we're seeing up here. So I've got this nice and dry. And now I'm going to start with different amounts of pressure. Now, sometimes, I am like with this line here, I'm really just cranked that down. I pressed really hard. And this one, I'm going to press hard too. That one there. And this one, I'm going to go a little bit lighter. This one is going to be a variable line because I want there to be a combination of, of different, essentially different intensities of how much wax is going to be put down by these. If I turn my head to the side as I'm doing this, I can see a little bit better where I'm going. So some things are just going to be coming out like this. And here, if I'm making a, a little line, it can come here, change its angle, and then stop at the edge of the cup. Because I'm not, I don't want a line to come across here and be picked up there. All right. So I put a bunch of lines across that. Um, and I can 
do a few with my crayon. But realizing that those might sort of pop out as much more sort of stark things. Now, I'm going to go back to the watercolor and I am going to mix up sort of a light brown wash here. So I'm going to take some ochre paint, mix it in here. Here's some buff titanium or just any light value that you have. Mix that up. And now the fun part is that as I paint this across here, la, 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 right, those, those, those marks are going to start to show through. And we have the same phenomenon going on, remember where we um, first put the paint down and we're like, where did my lines go? Where did my lines go? But then we're going to let that paint start to sort of settle off to the sides of it. And we hope to get some of those back. I'm going to also at this stage, make the edges of this a little bit Interesting. Now, let me get a little bit darker in here. We'll get a little bit darker in here. And let's see what patterns are starting to show up. I'm going to get my brush, kind of a clean brush. And as I'm looking at this, I'm starting to see some of my lines re-emerging. And as that happens, I'm going to go in and just trace over some of them to bring those out more. I want to try to make some of those lines lighter. And actually, I'm going to, before I do that, I'm going to slightly darken this even more. And I'm using kind of a, a almost sort of a stipply approach here. Now I can, I can see some of my lines better. Here's one, here's another, I'm gonna lighten that. Get a clean brush. Clean brush, clean brush.
So if I'm kind of coming along here with my watch, I'm just getting paint off my, my, my nest and I'm stroking through here and in places, especially where there's some of those white lines that paint really wants to come off. Really kind of reestablish that top edge of the nest. Look at all those neat lines now starting to pop out in that. This is really starting to become textural in front of me. Whereas before it was just sort of this, this uniform mass of... Mm. Now, I'm going to let this dry. And again, I'm going to use my hair dryer to speed up that process. I'm now going to come along and draw in just a little bit more detail on this nest. And what you're going to see is that I don't have to put detail over the entire thing. This is really starting to feel satisfying. I'm kind of getting the sense of all these little fibers going kind of crisscrossing over each other. On a few of them, I'm going to kind of put, kind of highlight their, their edges a little bit more. Um, the, um, hold on a second. So I'm getting my, uh, but I don't have to detail this whole thing. If there's a few little grass blades that I kind of clearly pick out as like, look, this is a grass blade. People will see those and then they'll see the rest of this jumble and their brain will fill in all the gaps for us. So I don't have to, um, I don't have to be um, detailed across the entire thing. I'm just getting on my brush here a little bit of sort of this dark brown paint a sharp tip. And I'm going to come along this edge of this. So let me first kind of test this here. There we go. I'm making kind of a lost a lost and found edge is going to be, a lost and found line is a line that sort of comes and goes. I don't want this to be a really kind of hard line. I want it some places to be stronger, some places to be lighter. And with a, a water brush, something that I like about them is that they allow me to kind of maintain a, a fairly sharp point. So just a few little edges there. I 
I'm mostly working on the surface that is right towards the viewer. Um, and the reason that I'm doing that is that I want most detail to be on the surface that faces you. I'm also going to put a little bit of shadows into, just like I did with the pencil before, I'm going to just put some shadows up kind of into some of these areas between things. I probably should have done this before putting in those little details. If I return this into a tutorial step-by-step -step in a book, I think I'll have that first. So first put in the shadows and then those details. It's usually good at habit to put in the details last. I just couldn't help myself because it just looked like so much fun. So you see I'm coming, kind of coming in there between some of these, these little fibers and just emphasizing shadow zones between them. So what I'm painting is not the grass blades. I'm painting the shadows between the grass blades. Try that over here. Here in the dark. I have a hard time just making up random cool looking darks. But when I have a little hint of these things um, on the, the page in front of me, because of all of those pencil lines, it's easier for me to kind of follow along the edges of them. right here along the edge of this bowl, I'm going to put some, I want this bowl edge here to feel like this is a light edge coming towards you. So I'm just dropping some shadows in on the side that is away from that, that makes this side of the bowl feel a little bit more towards you. If there are any parts of this that are feeling like that part is feeling really textural, that part is feeling really textural. Um, I want a little bit of detail to pop out in that area there in here. And I'm just looking for where there are little hints of the slightly darker places. And I'm just, uh, my brush is, is pulling those out and it makes so I'm taking advantage of that 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 scramble of paint that I had in there before that made those. And so it's not just a random scribble. Remember, I was following the contours of this bowl. Oh boy. That's starting to feel nesty, isn't it? Now I'm going to make some of these little fibers that are coming out have a little bit more variation in them. This is the part where I sort of think of putting in just a little bit of detail. And my general practice is I put detail in at the end of a drawing. And 
it's easy to kind of overdo it with this. So stop before you think you're done. And let me also just kind of highlight what I'm doing with my these little fine strokes with the water brush, because for sometimes when you start using water brush, you only get these thick strokes. So how am I getting these thin strokes? I have, I'm going to back up from this a little bit. I've got the side of my hand on my page. I'm holding my brush tip just so that it just lightly tickles the surface of the paper. And if I do that, I can get sets of fine little lines. If there's too much water in the tip of my brush, instead of making fine lines, it'll make one big glunk. And I don't want that. So if that's the case, I would then um, just wipe on a little rag and sort of re, then repigment my brush once I kind of got rid of that excess water. So that allows me just to draw along the side of a uh, structure. A few places I'm just putting in a few little kind of dots of darkness. And this gives me this lovely little nest effect. Other things you can do on top of um, uh, uh, something like this as well. Um, here I've done this all with watercolor. Um, if you have. Gouache paint, we looked before at using gouache, which is an opaque, an opaque watercolor-like substance. Um, you can mix up some light browns or light grays with gouache and paint those over, um, let's zoom down on that a little bit and paint those over um, darker surfaces. But um, if you don't have gouache, then the way that we approached it here is good. And there's something that I, you know, so here's some white gouache across some of the, something like this. So if I were to put some of this on here, I might have just a few little places where I could get a sense that some of these are these little tiny details. And I can put those on with my opaque. All of those are in our bag of tricks. Don't do this uh, too much kind of the light gouache on the back surface because you want that to be less contrasty. But on this surface here then the front, I can get away with it. I'm going to put a few last little bits of really intense gouache right in here. 
make a few parts of this really bright to add a little kind of moment of emphasis. I want people to look right in here with, by adding a little more contrast in there. That'll draw people's eye right into that part. Now, um, let's check back in with Jack and see if um, these techniques and approaches were the sort of thing that you were looking for um, to help you be able to do this. Um, so I'm going to allow you to unmute, and I'm going to add you in here in the spotlight. Yeah, that that helped a lot. I really like the um the graphite way and like just putting in the darks. Like it's funny now thinking back. Um, like half a year ago when I was trying to do this mess, I literally like went right into the colors and I just started doing it and it looked terrible. But yeah, th these are so helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll share what I did. Oh, great. Let me, I'm gonna uh, turn off my screen here. Hold on a second, remove my spotlight. Oh, hey, Jack, uh, these have volume to them. These really have volume. That's really this cool. This one was a little harder because um, I didn't have that one eraser, so I was using um, I was using the corner of this, which is still pretty um, it's pretty sharp, but it's still a little thick, so that made it a little harder. But yeah, those those are some really good techniques. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, so um, Jack, let me um, show you an approach when if you don't have so so first of all, those 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 two studies that you did totally successfully handled. So with that, you know, even not having the mono zero eraser, you, you rock that. Um, let me show you a strategy for when you don't have, you know, you, you just got the erasers that you've got or the erasers that you've got. What are you gonna do about that? You've got this big kind of clunky eraser. You think, I wanna get a fine detail with my eraser. What do you do? Well, um, I am going to show you, but first I'm gonna need to run into the kitchen to get the next drawing tool. So I'll be back in about 20 seconds. You ready? Keep everybody entertained while I'm talking. We could give him 22 seconds since it's- I'm timing two. him. Yep. <laughs> and did anybody else realize that today was the official twos day? It's um, Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. Wow. Two That's... slash two two slash two two. And, and also having it be Tuesday. What are the chances of this two 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 being on a Tuesday? I love that. Um, so what time tonight is it going to be the most interesting? When will it be in, in military time, 22 hours, 22 minutes, 22 seconds on. Oh, wow, this is, this is gonna get fun. All right, now, suppose that you have a big chunky eraser. All right. Where's a big chunky eraser when you need one? Uh, it's the one over here. Well, there's my blending tool. <laughs> I found that. Um, all right. So I have a big eraser, right? Um, what you can do is um, sometimes people think like, you know, if I've got a big eraser, I want to keep this thing in a nice little block because then it's all neat. And the idea of hacking up your eraser makes you think more little pieces, I'm going to be wasting my eraser, right? Because we're thinking like big piece, that's, that's what you want. But if you get crazy with your um, eraser, check this out. 
Um, here is my eraser. I'm going to cut off a triangular piece of my eraser. And the triangles are my friends. This has all these neat little edges on it. And watch what you can do with that. So I'm going to put down with some to be lead, a little bit of a smudge party. Then what you do is you use these blades. Well, you can kind of get in here with the corner of it and try to, but it, it usually doesn't work well. But what works well is to use the blades on this. And you imagine yourself kind of cutting with that blade. So the eraser, I was, I was using this as my slicing edge to, so there's, because it's all in a line, just one little tip running across there wouldn't really move very much, but because you have this whole this whole edge going across in a line. Wow. You like that's, it? That's crazy. I'm totally trying that out. All right. Yeah, it, it is. So using your um, this as as a slicing tool. That, that, is, that allows you to take a big clunky eraser and turn it into a precision tool. That's really cool. Isn't that fun? I never thought of that. Yeah, and, and, and the, the, the style points there are to, again, not to use the point, because everybody thinks like, oh, I'm gonna use this to kind of get this little erase thing erased here, and, and it's not working really well. It's really unsatisfying. But you, know, you, you use the blade. You use the blade of it and run that across. Now, if notice mine's kind of getting dirty, so I'm going to clean it by rubbing it on the paper. And that way, when I slice again, I'll get a nice clean cut. Wow, that is really cool. Thanks for the tip. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Jack, thank you so much for the suggestion for today's workshop. That was fun. Thank you. All right, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of your um, upcoming nest studies um, and uh, happy nest finding. Thank you. Are, are, are there any uh, nests that you know of that you'll be able to watch that are being kind of newly built nests that you'll be able to watch from a safe distance? No, oh, you, you have, I have to allow you to unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, ask me. There you go. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, there are some, so like in our forest, if you have the bunnies and like the rabbits and the squirrels have like slowly made their own little tunnels. And then we, um, in the summer, we always come through, um, in the winter, I mean, we always come through and kind of like cut a little path. So like we can crawl through and like see all the nests above us from underneath. That's so, really neat. Yeah, and there's an old nest outside um, that I've been watching, and that one's like from last year. And I'm like, I'm not even gonna attempt it. I don't even know how to do this. So that's I'm right, definitely gonna do all that. Thank you. And here's another neat one. If you find one that's really grass lined with like the shell of mud around the outside, that's a common nest throughout North America. It's the American robin nest, and they have these. Uh, they, they're, they're neat because they do this kind of combination grass on the inside, then a bunch of mud on the outside. Yeah, um, I wish I had known this trick back then. Um, I wasn't nature knowing then, but two years ago, right outside, like in our laundry room, if you go out the door, there's like an overhang where we keep some of our, um, um, my little sister's bikes, and under a, there was like a potted plant, and right next to the flowers, uh, um, Carolina Wren had built had built its nest right next to the door so like um we were like trying to get pictures of it so like we would kind of sneak out the door and my mom would like hold her phone in front of the nest 
and then try to take pictures. But like if you if you sneaked through the bush, um, because there were bushes in front of that, in front of the like overhang spot, you could like peek up through the bushes and see the nest. It was so cool. And like we watched the entire um life cycle. Like we watched we like all the time, like the mom would come in flying, building the nest once it was built. Um, a couple of days later, we saw eggs. Um, we watched like they're kept and uh, there was like six or so eggs. And after she laid all the eggs, um, we looked up how many weeks it took. And um, I forget how many it was. But after that amount of time, um, we there were chicks like they hatched. I think we even saw one hatch like, I don't know, maybe we didn't. But it was so cool watching like the whole process, like the um, dad coming in and feeding feeding them and I think they might have been it was really cool that's really neat um well I hope that this is uh the coming spring gives you all sorts of fun now that you are a nature journaler gives you all sorts of uh cool observation opportunities but yeah really solid work today on those um on those studies well done thank you really good to see you um does anybody else have um anything that they would like to share from your journals and what's going on. Um, I see Holly and Ray Bonto and Kate and Ivea have something to share. So let's start with, we're gonna start with Holly, then we'll go to Ray Bonto, then Kate and then and Ivea. Um, Holly, it's great to see you. You can now unmute and welcome. Hi, yeah, let me get my page turned here real quick. Um, so, I just wanted to share that um, we had two pairs of um, hooded mergansers and and I I wanted to draw a bit. It, I mean, I I spent all night, like half night drawing this thing. So anyway, this is how far I got. This is my hooded merganser. Oh, oh, love this bird. Aren't these yeah. incredible? And, but, and yeah. for, for yeah. anybody who's out there thinking like, no, you got the head shape wrong. No, she actually got the head shape right. This is just a really funky looking bird. They, <laughs> the crest, when they put it up, it's just stunning, isn't it? It is, it really is. And, and then I, I, I made this little, it's kind of like a goofy little puppet to show you the, the mating ritual, what it kind of looks like. So, so I'll, I'll hold it like against here. So this is what the bird looks like, like that in the water, right? Yeah. But then it does this crazy thing where, oh, can't hold that and that. Um, so, hold on. So its head is normally just tucked in like you see a normal duck. Yeah. But then it gets very excited and races around like with the like with chasing another male. The, the females seemed utterly unresponsive. They were just eating worms from the bottom of the lake. But this thing then it would wiggle its head, wiggle it, and then it, its neck would come the whole way out like this, and it would make this croaking, gravelly sound as it threw its head forward. It's just amazing to watch. That is so cool, and I love the puppet. Let's do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it would do all this shaking back and forth, and maybe flapping wings a little bit, and then the neck would come the whole way out like this. It would really look like that angle. That's how weird. And then it would throw the head forward, boom, and make this like grovelly, croaky sound that I can't even imitate it. It was so unusual, but it was, it was, it was su not super loud, but definitely audible. But if you oh, if you go, if you if you Google it, there's a lot of videos online. People don't. I, I don't need to Google it because I've got the puppet show, and <laughs> this is the best Nature Journal Club puppet show that we've we've had. This this is <laughs> such a great opportunity uh, idea for kind of explaining behaviors. This was brilliant. What what gave you the inspiration to create the the Mergancer puppet? Um, I have my granddaughter over a lot and we, you know, we just kind of do things. And I think she really sparks a lot of um, new thinking in me, you know, like, um, you know, I just, I just grab whatever's here and then we just go with it. And it's really exciting and fun. doesn't matter what we grab, we make, you know, just make, make it work. Oh, that's so neat. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. So um, this, I'd like to throw down the gauntlet for anybody else out there um, to um, create some puppets to animate your 
journal and nature journaling observations. I, I want to I want to say that Ray Bonto actually got me started thinking about doing something like this with his cool, you know, when he was talking about the birds that were mating and doing this, and he had all his cool pictures. But I can't draw those pictures yet, so I thought, well, what can I do like that? Even if I can't draw the pictures yet, so Ray Bonto definitely helped me out there. That's cool. That's cool. Why don't I bring Ray Bonto uh, into this this call? Um, Ray Bonto, so your strategies are are inspiring other folks um, mm -hmm. to 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 do things. Hold on, I've got to allow you to unmute. Um, Ray Bonto, you can now unmute. There we are. Um, so, you know, it is um, it's it's neat to see the way that one person's ideas, you know, it spreads into to others. Oh, I wonder if could you um, set up those in your journal with the little puppet thing like a pop-up thing so that you'd move the thing on the bottom and then the 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 the, the merganser's head would would move around uh, you mean in the are you talking to me yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right so so Holly, like could could you like take your merg answer, cut it yeah. out, and then take part of that down so that, that there's a little tab that where you can control the head and then just sort of have an arrow sort of going up and then over to sort of show the positions that you do with this to kind of get the head to go in the right place. Well, I'll see if this brain can work on that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. This is this is so cool. Hey, so uh, Ray, Ray Bonto, so you're you're inspiring other people to do um, behavior studies. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, thanks, Ray Bonto. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Thank you. And, and Holly, thank you so much for that. That's really cool. Oh, you're welcome. They were fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ray Bonto, what's going on in your journals these days? Okay. Um, I couldn't really do the nest because I had a ballpoint pen, but I did my best. <laughs> yeah. So um, um, may, I, may I show you a strategy for ballpoint pen? Yes. On that. So if you're doing that with ballpoint pen, uh, hold on a second. Um, what you can do is you can do, uh, let's see, where's my, where's the ballpoint pen when you need a ballpoint pen? Uh, here. Um, so I'm going to do a kind of quick little ballpoint pen study, and then um, I'm going to, there'll be a little trick at the end where we'll kind of uh, make it just, a, we'll kind of geek it uh, out a little bit to add some special cool to it. Um, so let's check this out. Um, add spotlight. All right, so here we are. Um, I am going to, I'm going to minimize your window for just a second. Um, and let's say I have um, I'm going to sort of do what I said not to do earlier, or I'm going to just sort of draw a bunch of these these little <laughs> characters um, all over it and sort of wrapping around. And um, but then I'm going to get in there, punch in those darks. So that those those uh, little grass blades themselves are sticking out more. So there's kind of that unsatisfying little squares that you get where they cross over. I don't really like that. All right, and so I would continue that across the whole thing. 
Um, this is a uh, what's called a this is a, a, a presto correction pen. And um, it's used for uh, kind of crossing out mistakes in writing and things like that. But it does make a very nice opaque that you can then put over parts of your drawing to uh, to pull those out. And once that's dry, I might then, let's say I want this one here to be on top of these, on, on top of this, under this, on top of this, and then under this one, right? So if it is um, on top of this, then I would just add some lines in there. If it is goes under this one, I would then add some lines in there. And then it goes over all these ones. So I'm going to add some lines in here. And then it is going to go under this. So I'm going to strengthen these lines here. So I can make, I can then sort of secondarily weave this in and out of other things after that. So that's kind of using, I suppose I'll use a, a good gel pen the same okay. way. Um, for some reason, your, your camera's out. Oh, pesky camera. Uh, let's try that again. There you are. There we are. <laughs> um, I also might be able to use the gel pen if my gel pen hasn't died. Uh, same way to kind of fill in some of those, those little spaces. Um, so that uh, can be a, another tool that you're using if you're kind of going with, with, with ink. So either using a correction pen or a gel pen um, on top of those lines to essentially to kind of get rid of those kind of annoying little boxes that you get when two lines cross each other. Um, so, but back to you, Ray Bonto. Um, let's, uh, you can now unmute yourself and um, I'm going to replace my spotlight with your screen. There we go. So, yeah, that's just what I did, in fact. Oh, um, cool. But in that's fact, I had already put the, well, the sh shading down, so it didn't turn out as well. <laughs> so, um, now, as for my pigeon stuff, uh, it was very, very strange today and yesterday. But anyways, a few days. Before that, just the stuff. Um, nice gesture, it poses. And anyway, um, yeah, um, that. Now it's very unusual that we get over jeans, but. Our fruiter just threw it away, so we had to bring it. <laughs> oh. And one was rotten. Yes. And uh, tell us about the, the little story that we have there with it. Oh, that's just nothing. Like, uh, my mom sent me to get stuff from the fruiter. If he was th because he if he throws anything away we get we get it for free. Um, <laughs> I took all of it, and it was too heavy, so I didn't bother to look inside and see the contents. I just um, somehow I managed to carry it home. <laughs> um, but <laughs> and when I came back, I found six baby aubergines. 
Oh, that's really fun. That's really fun. Um, yeah, looking at things that are slightly, you know, in the process of, de of decomposition, um, there are really interesting things um, going on with that. And that's, it's a really cool process to follow. A lot of people only draw sort of the perfect fruit. Um, but what I really like here is that you're, you've got, you're following this thing that is in a state of partial decay there. Um, and also mad points for the little comic of events that are going on um, in your, your, your life there. I like that. I like adding in those sort of personal touches. Let me grab my most recent journal. Hold on a second. Um, we're doing similar sorts of things. All right, coming back now. Um, the so we, we both are kind of geeking out um, with some some things that are are are, are wrong. Jack, this is for you. Oops, my camera died again. What's up with that? Why is going up? That's inauspicious. There we are. Um, so, uh, Jack, I'm continuing to do moon studies, um, but uh, let's see here. Um, you had that rotten. Yeah, this is this is big, ugly. The carrot. Um, same thing. Like sometimes there's there's the perfect carrot, that's interesting, but sometimes the things that are rotting and kind of turning funky on us have even more interesting stories behind them. And uh, so while you're looking at your, uh, your decomposing aubergine, um, the, uh, this was, uh, I was looking at my de decomposing carrot. So <laughs> that's, that's kind of fun. Um, and then somebody was asking what that critter was on the other page. These were condors at Pinnacles uh, National Monument. Um, so those were, it was really fun. There was some, this one was tagged. You can see the little tags, but yeah, California condors um, at Pinnacles. Um, here I taped a little map into my book. I want to try to start to kind of include more collage elements. <clears throat> um, but so just as you were adding in those little comics of you doing things, I think that that is a great way um, that to kind of enhance how kind of the personal resonance of your, your journal. Um, so uh, this is uh, just to sort of show you that I'm doing similar sorts of things, um, just as little kind of placeholders for events that I wanted to remember. This is, we're in a hotel, and this is Amelia and Carolyn being bed anacondas, um, uh, where they're jumping back and forth between the beds, trying to catch each other and laughing hysterically. Wanted to remember that. Um, this is um, just so to remember the feeling of hiking, holding um, Carolyn's hand. Um, this is uh, Amelia being a California condor um, spreading its wings. And Carolyn made slime out of algae. So I just sort of made these little icons along the side here, kind of like you did in your, your cartoon to just to help remember those, 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 those sort of personal things as well as like the biologist in me or the geologist would want to like, you know, is, is interested in the rock formations. Um, the daddy in me is also interested in sort of remembering those things. So I like how you're bringing that personal into your, into your journal. Yeah. Um, now, uh, this was very similar to Jack's mystery the other day, but even more dramatic. Oh. I gotta um, see, I gotta, I gotta see. There were pigeon breast feathers spread around oh. 
and I counted them. Guess how many? Uh, uh, over <laughs> close, over 163. 163 breast feathers. And maybe more. And even more mysterious, only eight out of those were from the wing. So eight wing feathers. Is it okay if Jack and I bring you in on this discussion? Um, so I'm going to allow you to unmute. I'm going to join you in here. Um, so you also had that, that those those studies of the where you found those feathers with um, without other bits. Jack, in yours, did you find wing feathers? Uh, no, but uh, do you know, is this hawk? Hold on. Yes, that looks like, do you have red-shouldered hawks in your area? Tons. Tons of red shoulders. That, to me. And, and red tails. Uh, at, at first glance, that looks like a red-shouldered feather to me. Yeah, so, um, even more feathers showed up. Um, so one was the last group. But yeah, whenever um, I shared that a while ago, um, I went down the hill yesterday and there were even, no, a couple days ago, and there were even more under the um, a big um, evergreen pine tree. There were even more. Um, I did, I wrote, hold on. You guys have some pressures in your neighborhood. I mostly um, wrote about it, but um, it was super windy, like 40 mile per hour gusts. At the bottom of the hill, there were tons of torn up hawk breast feathers everywhere. Hawks flying around above forest. The air is filled with, yeah, yeah, but I am very bad at imitating. The air, yeah. Red shouldered and red tailed hawks wheeling through the air, partly cloudy. Also, there's a nest high up in the trees. Hawk nest, maybe owl, mix of evergreens and dead trees in the forest. So yeah, even more feathers showing up. Right. Oh, wow. So this is cool. Um, so Ray Bonta, let's see your notes from, uh, so Jack, thank you for sharing that. Um, Ray Bonta, let's see your notes of, of this uh, uh, pigeon explosion. Do you think they're pigeon feathers? Um, I think so. Uh, some sort of white-breasted breed. Uh, and so, no blood. I tried searching for the corpse, but there wasn't any. Uh, even stranger, there wasn't any blood. So nobody could have killed anything. Um, so, no. So, 160, over 163 pigeon feathers from belly and breast but eight out of 163 are wing feathers, plus no pigeon corpse. Maybe a fox stripped off the feathers here and taken it somewhere else. Where could that be? But why then so many few wing feathers? Yeah, that... And another one is maybe it didn't like wings, so it didn't tear them. Um, and another one is two pigeons were fighting. Then there would have then there would be wing feathers. So um, let, let's uh, could could I could we see the 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 any any sketches that you made? Oh, how, <laughs> I love that pigeon sketch there. Check out that that pigeon for I that one's got volume three quarter view down on the back of it. Next level fast sketch. Love that angle. That's that's really solid, Ray Bantha, Ray Bantha. And look at the Y web you're making. Kind of you're connecting um, ideas and thoughts and 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 strategies. This is really cool investigation on paper. Today was very. Mysterious. Uh, well, I thought even Sherlock Holmes couldn't solve it, but I thought I did. Um, in fact, I did after a bit of thinking. <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, but first, um, I went there and 
it was raining lightly. Um, so I had to hide behind a tree and look, peek out and watch the pigeons. Mm -hmm. And until then a big drop fell on my journal from the tree and I had to close it um, for the moment. Then the sun came out. Um, and I saw this gray thing near the bush. Now, usually when I, um, in fact, I meant to roam around the park, but that was the only place where I could comfortably have my snack. So I went there. <laughs> um, and I found, I saw something gray from a distance. Um, I thought it was some garbage, but I would go there anyway. So I went there. It, to my surprise, it was what I thought it was, a dead pigeon. Ah, oh, sorry. You're muted, Jack. I'm sorry. I was just I was really liking this 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 uh, when you get one up close, it just allows you to kind of look at the structure of the wing and the 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 head so much more easily. Nice work. And um, that's a top view. And there's me trying to solve uh, the mystery, how it got killed. Um, okay. First, um, its wings were open. Yeah. Its eyes were white. Its nose was bleeding. Its neck was ruffled up. Its neck was a little fattened and shortened. Mm -hmm. And it was under a bush and above its head was broken twigs. And yesterday was a windy day. So it, the wind might have drove it into the bush head first. Oh, interesting hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> so your clues are the wings are in an open position. The neck is kind of scrunched down and, uh, and, and down. And I know human beings who have head trauma they often have, you can have bloody noses and things. There's some blood around the, the nares of this thing. Um, what interesting clues. And I love the way that you expressed your thinking about that mystery, where you said that it might have, uh, the wind might have driven it into that. Oh, and there's the actual measurement, the length on it, right? Nice. Um, so you're still using that, um, that, the, the, the language of uncertainty that scientists use when we're thinking about these sorts of things, where we say to ourselves, like, oh, I wonder if, you know, could it be that that was um, how that, that, that formed? That's, that's, that's exactly the way we should be thinking about this, Ray Bonta. What great mysteries. What great mysteries. It's something that I really like that you're, that you're in addition to your behavior studies now, you really have your radar out for where you are encountering nature mysteries. And, um, and, and that's, that's, that's fantastic. So let's, let's, I wanna encourage everybody who's watching this to in your own journal, don't just look for the things that you know, and here's a documentation of the things that you know. Um, Instead, look for that which you don't know, which you don't understand, and look for clues that might help you figure that out. And just as Ray Bonto is demonstrating here, when you're saying like, and I think that, or, or one possibility is, or could it be, I wonder if, you know, in, in coming up with our explanations, we want to use that tentative language, because that also, that 
that in their head separates uh, this from this is a possible explanation, even if it's very likely, from this is something that I directly observed, right? And we want to keep those things um, separate in our heads. So really good scientific thinking, um, really uh, wonderful journal pages. And how, how fun to also have a chance to kind of investigate that wing on somebody that's not, you know, doing this. <laughs> I even tried. Guess what? I tried to uh, attract the attention of the live pigeons to the, the dead one, and all they did was uh, a dead pigeon. Okay, whatever. <laughs> hey, this can't be bothered. S say it to the wing. Great. Hey, thank you so much for those investigations. That's really cool. Um, I'd love to bring on um, uh, Kate. You had some stuff that you're going to share. Um, yeah, I always try and have some stuff prepared before I come to class. Um, I don't know how much you've seen of my latest sketchbook. I've got this page where I've been kind of working on um, using different values just with pen to really simplify it and Oh, but, but also, folks, notice the way Kate is wrapping those pencil lines. See how those pencil lines follow the contour of that? You can just put your hand over the back of this thing and feel that. And also, oh, check this out. Note that um, she, her pencil, those, those pen lines are not going all the way to the edge. So she's leaving a little bit of room for some reflected light. And imagine if those lines went all the way to the edge, that would really flatten this drawing out. There's some really great drawing decisions you're making right in here. Yeah, and I tried to do some like just silhouette stuff with the oyster catchers. Um, mm. What I'm trying to do is to learn certain skills. I'll try and limit the tools I use. Um, I didn't love those so much, but I was trying to figure out what to do with this gray felt pen I had. I tried using it for doing more value studies with Harlequin ducks. Um, I don't love how they turned out for the most part, but I think it was really interesting looking at trying to get shape and then trying to really make uh, certain areas pop with just um, two tones. Oh, that's really cool. That's really fun. Um, what else? I'm trying to teach myself how to draw people. It's very difficult. <laughs> oh, oh, people are uh, the most difficult thing to draw. Yeah, because well, it's because we're there's, so there's actually, sensitive to what people look like. Yes, there's there's actually specific brain regions dedicated to reading faces and detecting minute differences in human faces, and yeah, so that's why you know. Anatomy for that. Nice. Um, yeah, I figure that's probably gonna be the hardest thing to like learn how to draw realistically. So, I've been avoiding doing it forever. Um, here's some like bird silhouettes from birding out on Semiyamu Spit um, this weekend. Wonderful, wonderful. And this is all. This is all since since we last talked. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um. Let's see. I think I showed you these, but I rewatched your uh, drawing two cons video. Oh. And did some oh, practice. Oh, fun! A little toucanette there. Yeah, um, there's a few more. And I was just on bird pixel having fun, kind of trying to Great mask my watercolors a little bit more. Uh, and a pitta, you've got a pitta. Yeah, no, you guys. The white faced ibis. What I tried to do with this one was layer the watercolors and really work on glazing stuff. So for this one, what I tried to do was I tried to do really vibrant colors underneath for the iridescence, like we worked on with the ducks the other day when I asked that question and then try and pull those colors through. Um, I think I may have showed these, but I tried to do some just floral studies. Um, flowers are another weak point. Love it. Yeah. And then I've been working on like trying to do stuff with watercolor paper. So I just figured like, okay, don't save your watercolor for nice projects. Just use it all the time mm -hmm. because Good call. there's no sense in saving it if, yeah. So I've been working on that. Like here's from the nest thing we did earlier. It's not finished, but um, I'll try and jump between doing the graphite one, my sketchbook, and then 
other thing from the ducks thing we did was working on like the Harlequin deck um, and just trying to do all the glazing. And to that end, there's another course I was taking where it had you just sort of work with getting to know your watercolors and working with glazing and trying to like create grids and stuff. So. Brilliant. This this is I mean, folks, just look at the 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 difference that making putting in all these pen and 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 pencil and brush miles makes. Just you're fearlessly diving in here. You that's you what I'm trying to do. I'm gonna try and um, make either like a YouTube channel or do something. I got like an overhead mount to put my phone on so I can do like um, speed paint videos. So I figure I'm just gonna start doing that and trying to would love that get people a little bit interested. So if, if you start doing that, let me know and I will help um, drive traffic your way. Um, we'll Perfect. get people um, finding that out. Oh, I just see I've actually got less than one minute before I'm teaching National Park Service vol um, staff and volunteers how to do some oh, nature gosh, journey. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I am going to, um, Vea, could I uh, pass the reins over to you? Um, so I'm going to make you the host. You are now the host of the meeting. And I'm going to go over and join the National Park Service. Um, and um, I hope you guys have uh, 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 a, a, a good conversation. Um, Kate, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, and thank you. I will see you all soon.